Hello, everyone. This is Martin Willis from Podcast UFO. And our guest last night did not show up, actually. And uh, this has only happened two times in uh, a 10-year span. It's a live show, and so I had to cancel it when she did not show up. I heard from her later saying that she was in her kitchen where her clock was one hour uh, behind. So be it as it may, I decided to post this podcast I did with the Basement Hangout. Um, This is with Chad and Bob. They're a lot of fun. It's it's on the lighter side, but I hope you enjoy it. Uh, They suggested that um, I play this since the guest didn't show up, and I thought it was a great idea. Our guests next week, there are three of them. There's uh, Matthew Sedagish, Kevin Knuth, and Gary Voorhees. So that's live next week at the usual time, 7 p.m. Eastern on Tuesday. Thank you, and enjoy this show. Hi, everyone. This is Martin Willis from Podcast UFO, hanging out with the Basement Hangout. With these two knuckleheads, is always a lot of fun. What's up, all you ufologists? Welcome to the Basement Hangout, coming to you from somewhere in American suburbia. My name is Chad, and with me as always is Bob. And we're back in person, thank God. So, so that is nice. Glad to be back in the basement. The basement missed you. The shuffleboard has had no action for two weeks. And you lost again. Oh, you <laughs> With us tonight is Martin Willis from Podcast UFO, our old friend. Martin, thank you for joining us. How are you this evening? I'm doing great. Hey, by the way, your basement looks better than most apartments. (laughs) That's very nice. Well, we did just finish it a a few months ago. What is that now? Like maybe four or five months ago? Yeah. And we got a shuffleboard. So before we... uh, Before we record, we play uh, a couple games of shuffleboard. Bob usually beats me, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, we're, we're upgraded. As you can see, we have a nice wood paneled wall here behind the big screen TV. Yeah. So, well, uh, I love shuffleboard. I'm not going to say I'm great at it, but, uh, you know, it's, it's really fun. I've played ever since I was a little kid. Oh, cool. Well, next time you're in this area, we'll have you over. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do it for money. (laughs) Of Absolutely. Chad doesn't like that. He likes that a lot. (laughs) Cause I usually lose. (laughs) So, Martin, the main reason we wanted to have you on is because, you know, we wanted to find out what is going on in the world of UFO. You have people on your show week in, week out, uh, reputable people, people that are very much into the topic and not even so much on the fringe. And so, I don't know, let's, uh, let's pick your brain. What, what's going on? What's new? Well, you know, as we continue on, uh, since the last time that we spoke, you know, some things have happened that have been pretty interesting. <clears throat> and that is, you know, there was uh, back, I think it was May 17th, there was a uh, congressional hearing on, they call it UAP. It's kind of funny because uh, if you, if I'm out there and I say to someone the word, I mean, the acronym UA, UAP, they say, well, what does that mean? And I have to say UFO. Exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And so, you know, the reason they they use that word is because they feel that the acronym UFO has a stigma of little green men and Mars and all that. So um, but I disagree with that, you know, myself, because, you know, it's a unidentified flying object. That's all it really means. So uh, and UAP is. Uh, oh, God. Uh unidentified aerial phenomenon, yes. I just yes. believe yes. That, that's what it is. And so anyway, um, so th- the hearing was May 17th and there was uh, some interesting things came up. They showed a couple of crappy videos, which mean nothing. And I, it's almost like a, it's kind of to muddy the waters or something. I don't understand. They, they must have a lot better videos than what, what they showed. Smoking and mirrors. one of them, it looked like it could have been a Mylar balloon. So they were, I, they were playing it down, in in my opinion. Um, they were asked about this. Um, there was the, a representative Gallagher was there, and he asked some really good questions. He he 
asked them if they ever knew anything about Maelstrom Air Force Base, uh, the nuclear warheads in the uh, UFOs, you know, st stopping them, you know, things like that, disrupting them and all that. And uh, they had no clue on that. Now, this is a military. And if anything could ever be classified as national security, if UFOs are messing with nuclear warheads, I would say that would be it. Now, I, since that time in the last couple of months, I spoke with a gentleman named Mario Woods. He's very interesting. Now, he worked at a, uh, an Air Force base in security at uh, another nuclear warhead site. He was on top level uh, security for that. He got called out in the middle of the night, and there was an object that looked like a, the sun over one of the missile sites. And he pulled in. Uh, this is just a great story. You know, uh, he pulled in and uh, well, he was he was passenger and the guy next to him driving just froze all of a sudden and like a zombie and wouldn't move or anything. He kept yelling to him and he couldn't get his attention at all. And then he saw beings. <laughs> it just gets crazy. Mm. He saw beings. And now the reason he was out there in the first place is because they got a, a five uh, a five level five alert at the missile site. Something was messing with it. So he had to drive out. He was about 20 minutes out and he was armed and all ready to go. And he saw these beings. And next thing you know, he wakes up uh, 16 miles later at the base of a dam looking up at the white wall of the dam not knowing where he is he gets up from the ground it's all wet he gets up from the ground he's not hurt or anything several hours have gone by um and he gets back in the truck and the radio's going they're looking for him and his partner is still sitting there like a zombie wow <laughs> and damn. So, uh so they get they get uh this happened in 1979 so this is but it's just a great story so his uh they, they radioed they he didn't had he had no clue of where he was so he had to stay on the radio so they they um triangulated uh the signal and found him um so anyway there's lots of stories like that and he so said, where was he though How, once they did find him he was at the base of a, a reservoir a dam that he had never been to before. And it was all dirt roads to get there. And it was the road that went down to the side of the dam, the, the vehicle, uh, the four wheel drive vehicle could just barely get down there. Um, and he had just, a, they were in a pickup truck. They did get out of there, but it was, you know, it was really tough to get out of there. So he has no idea how they ended up there. Never remembers drive, you know, riding there or anything. Never, he just has a lot of missing time. That's a it's an incredible story. And while he's telling me this, he's only told it a few times. He was on uh, Unidentified on the History Channel. They He did a real clip, you know, a uh, real quick uh, overview of that. But while he was, he and I were talking, he was getting really, really emotional. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there was absolutely, uh, there was no faking of any type. And it was uh, a, a great story. So I digress. I've really gone way off. Oh, no, that's amazing. He's talking about the congressional hearing and that they never knew about any of these situations. And he said that um, there were several times where that the nukes were in launch mode and no one put them in launch mode. And they drove a truck on top of the blast doors. Oh, this my. is a three ton blast door that's supposed to uh, blast off. So they drove the truck on top of the blacks blast doors put it in neutral and then got about about a mile away hoping that when the blast doors would go up the truck would fall down inside and stop the oh warhead crap. Being good gone. god <laughs> so that happened like three or four times and uh involving ufos and nobody uh at, at this congress hearing had ever heard of anything so, but uh, those stories are fascinating. When he was debrief, debriefed by leadership, I mean, how, how did leadership take that? And what do they do with that information? He said that he, he said everything to them. He didn't hold out for one minute. He told them the exact thing right down to the beings. He wasn't afraid to tell them uh, because he said it happened. So why should I be afraid to tell them? And have you ever heard of the name Richard Doty? 
Yes. Don't yeah. know why. Richard Doty, but <laughs> I have Richard, not. Richard Doty shows up. Now, Richard Doty is a disinformation. He worked for the Air Force, uh, but he did a lot of disinformation. There's a gentleman, there was a gentleman named Paul Benowitz that he basically do- drove crazy um, who was seeing um, UFOs in New Mexico. And so he's in, and Richard Doty now is getting airtime, which I, I don't like at all because he's not a nice man. He's hurt a lot of people and people are relying on him as if he's telling the truth now out there. Anyway, um, I don't care. Let him sue me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so getting back to the hearing, uh, Gallagher also mentioned the Wilson document, which is another rabbit hole. And I do not believe this uh, any credibility to that document at all. There's just, it's too, it, it doesn't make any sense. That's, that was a document basically saying that um, this Admiral Wilson was at, in Las Vegas talking to some scientists telling them all about, um, you know, aliens and UFOs and all that. And um, he says he was never there. And the notes supposedly taken from Eric Davis, who is the scientist that's mentioned, are all chaotic. They don't make any sense at all. And Eric Davis, I think, is liking the attention because he won't say whether he was there or that was his notes or not. He just won't say say it to anyone. So it's another one of these little conspiracy theories. And unfortunately, uh, Representative Gallagher mentioned that as well during the hearing. So mm. it was kind of discouraging to hear that because I just think it, uh, you know, when you throw in the things that are uh, iffy, fringy, um, it's going to make, you know, they're going to say, oh, yeah, I told you so. This is the bunch of bull, just like we all thought it was, you know. So there's a plenty of things out there that are very, very credible where they didn't have to throw this one at them yeah. as well, in my opinion. So the thing that fascinates me about congressional hearings is that based on their lack of knowledge and their attempt to to discover, there's one of two things, right? Either they don't have the information because there is a group of people inside of the DOD or other federal agencies that have the information and are not sharing it with Congress, which is supposed to have oversight, right? Mm -hmm. Or they do have the information and all of this is a dog and pony show. So yeah. e- neither of those uh, make me feel very good. I I think the latter makes more sense myself mm. um, because, you know, there there's, uh, I, I just watched something of Gary Nolan, who's been on my show, um, Dr. Gary Nolan from Stanford, mm-hmm. who has an interest in this. And he was basically saying that, um, when they come out of the hearings, the private hearings, that they come out wide-eyed, like there's something really going on. Pardon me, I can't. That's I can't silence my phone. No worries. That. So wide-eyed, like they heard something crazy. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I think they do know a lot more, and but I always I think this is uh, a case of a little bit of window dressing myself. And, you know, it's, for instance, here's a good, here's another thing since that meeting recently, NASA um, is looking uh, behind the science of UFOs now. I saw that. And guess what? Yeah. Guess what their budget is? What? (laughs) $100,000. Jesus. So you couldn't pay the director. (laughs) That's like uh, $100,000 and you're going to solve it. Okay. So... (laughs) Wow. Uh, they think that they'll find it. They think that it's uh, something to do with science that just hasn't been discovered yet, uh, which, you know, possibly some of these UFOs could be. I agree. Um, but but not all of them. And so I, I think it's uh, well, uh, I'm glad they're looking at it, but it, it does feel more like the dog and pony show. And, um, you know, it's been done before many times. So, you know, the uh, the Condon report the close of project blue book, um, nothing to hear, you know, nothing to see here, that type of thing. Yeah. Uh, when secretly there were, they continued on and uh, project blue book was also just like the cover of everything. That's not where all the really good cases went. 
So, um, so I think there is indeed part of the government that is has always taken this seriously, but I don't know how much more information they have than anyone else. I really don't know. They, so, they definitely have more videos. Yes. They definitely have more data. So let me ask you this because one of the biggest figures in the UFO world over the last however long has been Lou Elizondo. Um, you know, where is he in all of this now? I've heard some recent rumblings about he's starting to move towards this is a consciousness uh, involved yeah. thing, human consciousness projecting, or I don't, I don't honestly, I'm not smart enough to even understand what that means. I've had several guests try to explain that to me and I'm still confused. Yeah. So don't feel bad. And it's nothing to do with smart enough. It's just, it doesn't, it's one of these things that are so, it's so hard to comprehend. I don't really understand. I, I couldn't go about trying to explain what people have tried to explain to me. Uh, <laughs> a lot of, a lot of it is supposedly a manifestation, um, you know, but that doesn't make any sense in so many cases when there's multiple witnesses. And But the people that talk about this seem to have an answer for it all. I don't know what the answer is for that. Look at the Phoenix Lights when there's probably over a thousand people um, that witnessed that, yeah. you know, phenomenon, the, the craft that could have been miles wide. And uh, back in the 19th, March of 13, 1997 was when that happened. And uh, so, I mean, you can't explain something like that with consciousness, I don't think. Yeah, that's, I don't even know what it means, consciousness. So he's saying, like, he's trying to say that people are thinking about it and then it's occurring to them type thing. Or not, yeah, type of thing. Maybe, maybe not even consciously thinking about it, but it somehow manifests in, in a way, and but yeah, it's so not really sighting. there. Yeah, mass but sighting is. When they say it's not really there or whatever, you know, that doesn't make any sense either because there's plenty of data that shows that there is something there. But on the other you hand, know? Elizondo is on the side of that the, the phenomenon is real. He's not saying yeah. that this is fake and it's just humans projecting. He's saying something about that the universe is more than we can comprehend and these... UFOs or UAPs are, I don't know if it means dimensional. Like I said, I don't understand. It's an unknown, but it's there is what he's saying. Yeah. But somehow our consciousness is involved and maybe it goes back to what we hear from Preston and you know, where it's, I, you know what? I don't even know how to verbalize it. It's just beyond me. So is he saying like, like, uh, people take shrooms or something like that or I <laughs> know. And he did at one point um, say that um, it's not something that we as humans can fully understand, well, it seems, which means yes. yeah. it's not just nuts and bolts, basically. It seems that way. but Right? It's not just yeah. craft. I like that phrase you just said, that we we don't think we'll, you know humans could understand it. I think that is probably very true. And um, I think that I also, and it's it's hard to, comprehend this what i've heard and think of is that if we had it explained to us what this ufo phenomenon is we may not even be able to understand you know i mean there are those possibilities or you know they could be several different types of things now recently i had uh just the other day i had dr michael masters on and his theory of what ufos are is us in the future as time travelers Oh, I like that. And That's one of my favorite back. theories, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, but I think it is if, if they, and it, that could be part of it. That could be one part of the puzzle. I still think that there's a, a, a good argument for the extraterrestrial um, hypothesis of, of these, or at least some of these, um, you know, the argument for that is, you know, the, the great distances that, would have to be traveled and you know to give a perspective it's really hard to understand how far four and a half light years away the nearest star is i'll put it like this this was uh, told to me by an astronomer if the uh if you were sitting in washington dc and the sun was the size of a, a grapefruit um the uh earth would be 
the size of a ball on a ball of a, I'm sorry, of a ball, uh, a ballpoint pen, mm -hmm. you know, the little tiny minuscule ball in a ballpoint pen. And the nearest star would be in San Francisco. Yeah. Wow. So that's to give you some perspective. If you take the earth, shrink it down to the size of a ballpoint pen, um, uh, the distance is vast, but I think that there is some type of way that uh, we just haven't figured out the physics yet, but there may be some type of way since space time is joined together that they know how to travel this uh, distance in, you know, in ways we can't comprehend. So I think part of the, you know, them could be uh, extraterrestrial. The time travel, however, a really great conversation I had the other day with Michael Masters. And uh, he is an anthropologist. So he thinks the way we're evolving could possibly uh, go toward the grays that a lot of people are saying they're seeing. Uh, the gray aliens, they have the big black eyes, their skin is kind of gray, uh, no noticeable nose uh, or ears, a slip for a mouth. Um, they're always thin, so I don't know. They they got their they got fast food. <laughs> they got uh, um, but uh, so I I said the other day or uh, last Tuesday when I had him on, I said, well, what what if we wipe ourselves out? And could a new you know like in the millions of years because the humans as we know them have only been around for two to three hundred thousand years. Um, so and. And I, I think it's possible we might have had some manipulation myself, possibly from extraterrestrials, possible. Um, but so anyway, uh, say we wipe ourselves out. And there's a lot of people thinking that we probably may in the next hundred years. Um, yeah. You know, very possible. So we this is this is one of my favorite theories, because if you think about um, I don't know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, whatever it is, when people were mostly outside hunting for food, gathering, living in huts, whatever, like animals, you know, more intelligent, obviously, but we've moved indoors, we're air conditioned, you know, we have heat, we're sitting in front of computers that are doing our thinking for us to a large part. We don't need our muscles like we used to, right? Yeah. We yeah. Um, are, I mean, they talk about birth rates going down, they talk about fertility going down. That's true. Um, so you could see us not needing, say, the the pigment in the skin because we're not going to be under sun. So I thought you were going to say the penis. Yeah, you're going <laughs> to say no sex organ. I always <laughs> need the penis. <laughs> no, and some people theorize that maybe we were very, you know, advanced and we were wiped out, and now that's yeah. like us starting again, three hundred thousand yeah. years ago. That's so, kind of what I'm thinking. Could that could happen as well? But and but right now the way we're going, you know, we we. To, for us to survive, we really need like two earth, Earths full of resources to survive as is. If everyone lived like Americans, we'd need five Earths, you know, mm -hmm, so yeah. and we're growing up to near the eight, eight billion mark. But um, I did mention that to him and he said, well, yeah, but he believes that that may be like the tipping point and we'll start going the other way because sperm counts down. Uh, there's going to be um, there is this thing called pornography which uh, a lot of people get involved in. and they're too I don't lazy. know what that is, Bob. Do you know what that is? I've never heard I'm of not, it. I've never watched such <laughs> things. But they, but they think that actually that made it, that may slow the birth rate down as well. You know, I mean, it's, uh, it's easier, I guess. Um, anyway, uh, it's all fascinating. So oh. he, he thinks that it's, it's, and then I said, well, okay, so you have the grace. Then what about, um, say, at the aerial um, incident, aerial school incident back in 1994, they saw these beings that also had the same type of eyes. However, their skin was like porcelain. One of them had long black hair. Um, these beings were within four feet of one person I talked to. I mean, they saw them very clearly, very closely. And uh, so I said, what about them? Is it possible that they could be millions of years beyond the grays? or less or, you know, and he has a yes, um, yes to all that. It is possible that these, the different types of beings are uh, different in vol uh, of all evolutions of, uh, you know, beings throughout time. Um, because just like uh, we invented the wheel, we're not gonna stop using the wheel. Just like uh, if they invent time travel, they'll probably keep, 
using time travel. So uh, anyway, it's all fascinating. And so I said, so these UFOs we're seeing, um, are they the travel time travel machines? He said, yes. He said, but I don't think the triangular ones are. And I never, I never followed up (laughs) on that. I'd like to know why he said that. I, I forgot to ask him exactly why he didn't think triangles were because that's the u.s air force yeah probably you know, so that that could be except they've been seeing you know i have a, a friend that found out that i did a show on ufos and she called me she goes oh my god she goes i saw a ufo back in 1978 and she described it to me and it was a t- perfect triangle back then hmm. so i think if the military was developing and she said it made no sound it was right over her car and then it shot off like a bullet mm, yeah uh, 1978 this happened flies off no sound i think we'd be using it at war time if we had something like that yes back in 78 yeah unless the only time you're going to use it is when it's truly existential and we haven't been in in any existential war since world war ii right? that you know of true <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. Okay, all right so all right uh, i i've thought about that too but do you really think that that could be kept quiet for all these years? I mean, some people no, say, yeah, this is the reason I why I don't believe in conspiracy theories in general. I don't believe that nine 11 was an inside job. And I, I have dealt with government, you know, in my, in my real life. And I know that it's a lumbering, you know, inertia ridden organization and there's loose lips and all that. I don't believe that you could hold something like, 9 is an inside job. The moon landing was faked. We have UFO technologies. I, I do believe it would leak. You know, yeah. humans being humans. I do, too. I do, too, eventually, you know, on deathbed or whatever. You know, I mean, um, Ben Hansen, a friend of mine. I don't know if you ever heard of him. He's been on a few uh, fact or fake, uh, a few different TV shows. He does a lot with UFOs. And fact his or fiction. Grandfather, his grandfather was in some, every time something would happen, he would go away and, you know, be dark for however long it took. So on his deathbed, he's holding his thought, not Ben's hand, but his father's hand. And he says, I just have one thing to say. We're not alone. Yeah. That's one of the last things he said on his deathbed. Wow. And so uh, I I do believe that um, things leak. They, they leak out on deathbeds a lot yeah. of times because people have nothing to lose. They already got their pension. Yeah. They're not worried about anything else. And so, so one of the conspiracy theories, if I have this correct on the president, is it that Truman signed a deal with the aliens to allow them to abduct a certain number of people so that yeah. they wouldn't just destroy us? So that's why um, abductions I think it was, up. was it Eisenhower? Eisenhower. Maybe it was Truman? Eisenhower. I can't remember Eisenhower. if it's Eisenhower or Truman. I think it was Eisenhower and I think it's, I think it's another conspiracy theory myself. Yeah. I really don't think so, but yeah. Sounds that I way. haven't seen anything that really, really leads to make me believe that's, that's so. So um, go, going back to your, it. going back to your time travel. So if, if these crafts are us from the future traveling back, is that like a school history lesson or are they coming back to check like an experiment or what did he say on that? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, you know, encounters and abductions and things. It makes you wonder what's going on with that. And are they taking DNA? Um, but, you know, you're talking about maybe history. I would think that, um, you know, Abraham Lincoln would have seen a UFO uh, when he was giving <laughs> the Gettysburg Address. Or, you know, I mean, if they're doing that type of thing. I would think some real historic things that have happened, uh, you would think that, Uh, they would be there. There are in wartime, though. As a matter of fact, back in the 1990s, before I was even giving this topic any thought at all, my insurance agent told me uh, that he was in a special Air Force unit that was, um, that was, uh, what did he say, researching UFOs during uh, the Vietnam War. He was in the special unit. And I've been trying to find the guy. I have even did some work last week trying to find him. Uh, he may have been pa- he may be passed away by now, but um, but anyway, uh, there is a lot going on in war times in the in regards to UFOs. He said every time they were napalming, they would see UFOs, which is really bizarre. Um, so is that history? Um, I, I don't know. And then there's the Foo Fighters back 
during World War II that were seen everywhere. They didn't look like discs or anything that you would think. Just balls you know, of light. If it was, yeah, balls of light. And um, there were, uh, I just listened to a report from a pilot. Um, this is a an old interview from the 40s. And he's saying that it was on his starboard wing. And then instantly it was on his port side wing, you know, in a flash. And, you know, they opened up fire on the thing and it absorbed the 250 rounds of tracer bullets and did nothing. Oh, wow. So uh, quite a story. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you know, maybe they are going back to wartime. The Foo Fighter thing doesn't really make any sense because they're not disc shaped like uh, so the supposed time travel machines are, if that's what they are. So, uh, yeah, it's it's all interesting. And it just seems like if they are if they had the capability to go back in time, then why didn't we hear about them throughout history? Yeah, there'd be more and more viewers, right? You would think unless they just are only interested in the time we are in now, you know, since 1940s. And um, he mentioned something about, you know, that's when we're firing off our first nuclear weapons. And maybe they're they're coming back to kind of slow that down or something. I don't know. Well, I don't know. I mean, um, are you familiar with the whole Keelian aspect of all of this? The John, what now? John Keel. Oh, John Keel. Um, I, yeah, a little bit. Um, very interesting character. Um, yes. But so um, his, his whole thing was that, you know, in the 19, early 1900s, 1910, 1920, 1930, even they were seeing airships, right. That looked oh, like, yes. they looked like floating ships in the sky and they would land and the people would come talk to them. Uh, and yeah. then in the 1800s, they'd see something else. And it was like the phenomenon always took, whatever form, you know, we would in our current culture uh, be able to accept. And so they didn't, they weren't flying discs in the 1800s, right? Uh, now they've right. moved from flying discs to triangles or Tic Tacs or whatever. Whereas in the 1930s, 40s and 50s, it was always flying discs. So, you know, what's up with that? And what I saw was a disc, you know, my one yeah. encounter it was nothing really special, but it was definitely a disc. Um, now, uh, I recently came, someone sent me a great, <clears throat> uh, English document from 17, I think it's 1779, I believe. And, uh, it's the whole thing is going in, they're out to sea and they're going in this whole detail of seeing this, um, this UFO basically it didn't say, did never, never described the object shape, but it did say there were beings on top of it and flashing lights. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a great 18th century document. Yeah. <laughs> and then we have artwork, even, um, you know, artwork that shows um, it's biblical in nature, but then in the background is, uh, it looks like a ship with a being inside of it floating across. Yeah. There's things yeah, there's like that too, right? Renaissance era. Um, yes, there are some paintings like that. I, there are some scholars that have tried to explain that away, but they certainly do not. That supposedly that's God up in the sky and all that. But mm -hmm. I'm telling you, it really, uh, it really does look like uh, in UFO. several of these paintings that it looks does look like a UFO more than um, than you would consider what God would look like. Yeah. Now, just to add to the confusion here. What about the topic of USOs or what do they call it? It's not multimedia. What's the word they use yeah. for it? Yeah, it's um it's transmedium. Transmedium, there you go. Mm -hmm. And yeah. there's a there's a, a new group I think operating out of the Pentagon that just changed their name and they incorporated right. transmedium into the, it. They call themselves the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. Yes. <laughs> wow, Amazing. That's fancy. Name. That I love fancy. that. That is nice. Yeah. <laughs> or A A R O. And um, I'm really glad that they are looking into that because people have talked for years. Um, even a friend of mine was on board a submarine and what they call the, the fast movers. And all of a sudden it comes up on on um, sonar where this thing's doing over 200 knots when this guy was on board. And this is happening a lot. Try to picture something going 200 knots, which is probably about 200 and 
25, 30 mile, miles an hour. Yeah, in the um, water. With the water pressure around it, going mm. that speed. This is going way, way back. So a lot of these have been seen. Um, and, you know, we know more about the moon surface than we do about the ocean floor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it goes, it goes down to 11,000 feet. We have no idea what's, um, you know, down <laughs> And the Beyond. Mariana Trench or anywhere else um, in the ocean. Very little exploration of the ocean. So I and a lot of people have reported over the years of seeing things, objects, and and uh from way back too, people have talked about things coming out of the ocean. So um people have suggested that we may have a presence here on Earth hiding in the oceans. Um, I think it would be awful miserable to be down there because, you know, there's really nothing to see. It's all dark once you get down below so many feet. Um, so, but uh, that's that would be a really good place to hide considering, you know, we're 70 some odd percent ocean um, on the planet. Um, whoops. Uh, I'm sure, I'm sorry. I'm just sharing my uh, screen with you here real quick. Oh, okay, sure. I wanted to uh, get your take on something. Um. So you uh, famously, at least in our eyes, not that many other people know about it, uh, debunked a UFO sighting that uh, Bob and I had in, in the backyard of the basement hangout. That's, That's right. Uh, That's true. And we were in awe. I don't that consider myself a debunker, but yeah, okay. Yeah. You pointed out that uh, what we saw, we saw a light traveling. It was obviously not a plane. It was far off in the distance. And it was moving in one direction, and then it just disappeared. And we were certain that we had just witnessed the first UFO incident. And you uh, explained to us that satellites do that as the reflection of the sun uh, goes behind the Earth. And we were very disappointed. But um, so I wanted to get your take on this. So we were at me and my family were at Virginia Beach, and we were on the Ferris wheel. And my son was taking, he's uh, 12 years old. He's got an iPhone and he was taking pictures of the city uh, at the, when we were at the peak of the Ferris wheel as we went around. And he didn't see any of this that you see up here while we were taking pictures. And I didn't see it either. I wasn't looking up there to be honest. The next day he goes, daddy, daddy, uh, check out the picture I took last night. There's these strange lights in the sky that I didn't see while we were there. And hmm. if I zoom in on it, so I did think maybe this could be the uh, Starlink satellites, but those are in a row. My understanding Yeah, those is. are very, very much in line with each other. Yeah, so, and, and Virginia Beach does have a Navy base nearby where they're always doing, uh, you know, you can just be on the beach and watch the uh, fighter jets flying back and forth yeah, every day. But this is not a formation of fighter jets, right? Cause this yeah. is very uh, random. So what in the world is that? Zoom in more when you zoom in more, what do you, it just kind of fades, uh, gets blurry. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, with an iPhone camera, you can only get so much, but yeah. uh, you can still see the dots there. Yeah, I really have no idea. I don't know uh, what to tell you on that because a lot of times you can say, well, you know, it could be insects. Uh, some birds fly at night, uh, reflecting the the city lights and stuff like that. But I have I have no idea. Um, it's it, there, you know, for the person listening to audio, uh, you may want to put this in the show notes or whatever if you do that that type. Yeah, of thing. we will absolutely. Yeah. But yeah, it's uh, very interesting. And, you know, a lot of things are caught when people absolutely have no idea what they're, they're shooting. Yeah. Um, a lot of times they can be, uh, you know, it has to do with the camera, uh, with the lenses. Sometimes you'll get, if you can take that pattern of lights and go down to the city and see if you can find, make that pattern of lights overlap with anything down below. Sometimes what happens is, the camera will make this effect where it'll show the lights that are on the ground um, up in the sky. That has happened in oh, a lot of pictures hmm. with people taking pictures of. Uh, Sounds like we need a basement hangout field trip to Virginia Beach. Bob. And it's not debunked. <laughs> That's good news. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. not debunked. No, I did yes. not debunk. <laughs> <laughs> it is real, Martin. This it's is still unidentified. Yes. Correct. <laughs> yeah. 
No, I am identifying it as aliens. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Yeah. Uh, no, thanks for showing that to me. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe you can send that picture to me too, and I'll look at it really closely and see if I can figure out anything. But, I will, but at first I need to add uh-oh. a copyright notice on it. Just so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so do you have a lot of people reach out to you with uh, pictures or evidence? Yes. Yes, really? and oh, I have on neat. my website, on my website, I'll throw it out there, podcastufo.com. I also have on that site where people can anonymously post their UFO sighting. And I have the Google uh, CAPTCHA on that where you have to, you know, click how many boxes you see buses in and stuff like that. Yeah. But the robots have figured out how to get around that. Really? I had <laughs> Russian, Russian porn on there posting like 50 of them the other day when I woke up. That's nice. Vladimir Putin. <laughs> so um, I, I have to take that. I have to take that post um, site down. But also if someone I did, if anyone wants to, you know, contact me and anonymous, anonymously post, all they have to do is go to my contact form. And so um, I do have people reach out to me all the time. And when I can figure something out quickly, I tell them, and sometimes I never hear back. Sometimes people are very unhappy about it. If I can figure it out, um, then um, if it looks really, really good, like something recently looked really, really good to me, um, to the point where I said I would come down there and I'd like to see these things. I guess they're happening all the time. I'd like to see them live. And already they have a film crew from some TV shows showing up there. Oh wow! So uh, that's that opportunity is gone. But for the most part, um, there are there are some interesting things sent to me, but usually it can be explained. And when I can't figure it out myself, I send it along to my good friend Mark D'Antonio, who is an astronomer, but he's also a video and photo analyst for MUFON. So I send it along to him, and sometimes right away he'll figure it out. And uh, sometimes I don't hear back from him. Like, for instance, the last one I was just talking about, he never got back to me. I keep saying, Mark, well, what do you think? And so, um, because he says that he has been able to explain just about everything he's ever seen, except for a few. So so he's the um, one starting his own TV show. That means that one is <laughs> real. <laughs> yeah, it could very well. There's something going on. I mean, it's really incredible. It's, um, it's a triangle and, you know, moving in formation and, um, you know, it looks, looks pretty darn good to me and no sound. Um, and reoccurring, you said. Reoccurring. And this is a funny thing that happens. And it's always a, a big question mark, if you ask me. Why does something happen over and over and over again in the same location? Mm-hmm. You know, why is it a hot spot in this in the same thing happening over and over? And uh, wouldn't they want to, like, if they're here from wherever they're at, wouldn't they want to, you know, explore around a little bit? Check out the Grand Canyon? All that, you know, why why just show up in a Pennsylvania cornfield and over and over and over again? It's a history so, class. Speaking of that, how do you feel about the whole Skinwalker Ranch deal? Well, I've I've had uh, the people on from that show on a number of times, and uh, I think it's a very interesting area. I'm not a hundred percent sure if I could tell you um, when it comes to all the things that are happening there, um, if all of them, if some of them might be embellished a little bit, I do believe that that's a possibility. They have uh, Travis Taylor, who's been on a couple of times, Dr. Travis Taylor, he has two PhDs. Um, He's very good for TV. He really is very enthusiastic. He kind of explains things, half explains them, but I have a good friend that is a scientist and he's he has a real beef with him. He's saying that's not real science. This is that that uh, you know piece of equipment's not used for that. Why are they use oh, that? Really? And, you know, on and on and on. <laughs> so it's uh, so, but you know things have definitely happened there. Why there? I have no idea. Sometimes I wonder if it might have to do with something in the ground or something. like a magnetic you know. field. Yeah, uh, say. There's uh, where things happen, like the brown lights, uh, the brown mountain lights. Um, you know, that mountain is half copper. 
Um, and it seems like there, there may be some minerals and things in certain places that may draw something to it somehow. And sometimes explainable this has, has, has Leden lights and uh, what am I trying to think? Is it Sweden? Somewhere over there um, in Scandinavia, there's the Heseldon lights. And that's another fascinating uh, anomaly that happens. And it may have to do, it's been seen for a, over a hundred years and may have to do with some type of uh, geological type of situation. So there's, another, there's a whole way of thinking that says that... Um you're familiar with the, uh, the disappearance issues in, um, people go hiking and stuff and then they just disappear. What's that guy's name? David Politis. David Politis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In, yeah. Uh, 411. Yeah. Yeah. Missing 411 uh, and then Sasquatch and all that stuff. There's a way of thinking that says that a lot of that stuff seems to happen where there's large granite deposits, right? Huh? How about that? Which is a I strange thing. That. Yeah. He's a very interesting guy. Um, and he's done really, really good work on that subject. And it really is amazing how many people just vanish. Yeah. And, and you never heard from again. Well, the most fascinating part about it is that a child, for example, will disappear or, or an adult. And the search parties will go out and they'll scour the entire area, you know, 100 square miles, helicopters, everything. They won't find anybody. They'll be basically written off as, as gone. And then uh, a month later, they'll find the body in the same spot it disappeared, which That's they right. searched, mil you know, hundreds of times. Uh, that happens a lot, which is really kind of scary. Yeah. You, you know, so uh, yeah, that whole, that whole thing is, is kind of scary to me. And then we know, start and getting into the discussion of, you know, dimensions. Yes. That's another thing that, you know, UFOs could be from another dimension. Right. It isn't, there could be interdimensional traveling. That could be um, what ghosts are. You know, they could be um, part of that. And I, I actually had like a poltergeist type of situation in the, um, I'm in the antiques and auction business. And I was at a property where some crazy things really happened to me. And I saw with my own eyes that things that were unexplainable and there has to be some type of explanation, but I have no idea what it was. Oh, tell us about that. What did you see? Well, it may seem kind of mundane, but to me, and these things, they really did happen to me. So, and it isn't, I think it's interesting. Okay. So I'm cleaning out a house. It was a, a real slow time of year in the auction business and I'm cleaning out a house in Portsmouth, New Hampshire and it was from the 1940s, I think, or 30s. It was not a, like a real early house or anything like that. And I had already taken all the antiques out of it. And the lawyer said, hey, look, is there any way you can go in and, you know, do a sweep down and get it ready to sell, you know, throw, get rid of everything. So I said, sure, you know, slow time of the year. It was, it was uh, winter, but um, it was a nice day in, in the winter time. And so there was no wind or anything. And. So I'm working away and I sweep up the upper uh, floor, you know, the hallway and I slide the broom down because everything has to go out. So I slide the broom down the staircase and across from the staircase is the main door. And I had that wide open all the way back. So um, I'm upstairs in one of the bedrooms and I pull open a closet door and I could barely get it open because they put in a carpet and they never cut the bottom side of the door. So the door, you had to drag it by the carpet to open it. And there was not much in there. Some clothes I tossed into a garbage bag and clothes hangers, things like that. So I walk out to the hallway and all of a sudden that door slams. I mean, it slammed hard. I go in, I look and the, all the windows are down. The storm windows are down. And there's, there's no force that could have done that. So then I, just to test it, I try to open the door, a closet door again, and it's really hard to open. <laughs> and so there's nothing physically wow. that could have done it. So um, all of a sudden the front door slams. Again, there's no wind that day. I walk down the stairs and the broom is leaning up against it. 
So the door slam, front door slams, that's leaning up against it. So I go outside, there's no way. And the guy that I had helping me that day, he took the uh, truck and trailer off to the landfill. And he came back and he said, why aren't you work? <laughs> you know, finishing, <laughs> you know, and, I, and I'm the boss, but he always teased me. So uh, I said, I'm not going in that house. That house is haunted. I got a couple of things in there. I need you to come in with me. So we're in there and he's going, woo, you know, he's teasing the heck out of me. So we're cleaning out the garage is the last thing. And uh, he, he takes off. There's just a couple of things left. He takes off. And um, so I said goodbye to him. And, but right before he left, he turns and he said, Oh, that basket in the middle of the floor. I see those baskets all the time. It's one with a great big wicker basket with a big loop. He sees them all the time because he worked at a funeral parlor and he says they're always in, you know, flower arrangements that are on those all the time, you know, at the funeral parlor. So um, I clean everything out and it's all in the back of my truck. And then the basket is the last thing. So I go over to the basket and I reach down to it by the big handle and it's stuck. So I pull on it and I pull on it it's stuck so hard that it breaks in half and the bottom stuck on the ground. So I toss it in the truck and then all of a sudden I got this feeling I go, oh no. So I went back and I tapped the base that stayed on the ground with my foot and there was nothing holding it there. Mm. Oh, wow. That's it, was, it just like slid right across the floor. Wow. So that's what happened to me. And it really did happen. I would take any type of lie detector test or anything. I would even, um, you know, risk all the money I have in the world if I'm wrong. Because it really did happen. I yeah. can't explain. It's nothing, you know, like I didn't see anything, uh, but I didn't see any being or anything. But something did those things. There is yeah. some type of answer for it. And I don't know what the answer is. Yeah, for sure. So my wife was, we were visiting her parents' house, my in-laws, and um, her dad worked at a church. And the church would give away donations and stuff to people who needed it. And then every once in a while, they'd have leftover stuff that nobody was getting or nobody was claiming. So he comes home one day with a suitcase, a nice suitcase that he thought they could use. And my mother-in-law, who's very superstitious, they're from uh, South America. She's very superstitious about that kind of thing. And she said, get that thing out of here. We do not, you know, take other people's uh, luggage. There's a certain energy that comes with it that we don't want to have here. So my wife and my uh, mother-in-law are in the kitchen and it has one of these windows that overlooks the family room. And yeah. so they see out of the corner of their eye, they're talking, they're doing dishes. They see uh, my father-in-law pick the suitcase up and walk out through the back door, the glass sliding door to take it out to the shed. And they think nothing of it, whatever, whatever. And then five minutes later, the, my father-in-law comes from upstairs walks into the kitchen and he's like, Hey, what's up? And they say, didn't we just see you walk outside? And he says, what are you talking about? I was upstairs. And then they look oh. out and the luggage is still sitting there. It had oh. actually hadn't moved. Now, both my mother-in-law oh. and my wife saw this together. And so they were freaked out. So my wife came home and told me this story. And of course me being me, I'm like, yeah, you guys probably were, you know, just imagining or whatever. You saw something out of the corner of your eye. At that moment, I had a piece of luggage in my closet in my house that had been sitting there for years that I had never used. We heard a bang. Something hit the floor. I go in my closet and look, and that piece of luggage fell off the closet top portion, whatever, and hit the ground. You, you officially just gave me goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> and was that a used luggage or was yours brand new? No, mine was mine. I'd owned it always. But it was like something was saying, yeah, oh, it. you don't believe me? You know, here it is. And that thing that had been, so either it was a massive coincidence that that thing had been sitting there for over a year yeah, that's and just massive. now decided to fall, right? So those are the unexplainable things you just walk away from going, well, whatever, Cause what are you going to do? You know, call the, the, the priest yeah. to come and, you know, bless your yeah. house. <laughs> <laughs> so in the antique business though, did you hear stories like that where someone thought yeah, something you was must attached? run across that stuff a lot? Yeah, there was, um, you know, there was another situation where 
I was in a house uh, getting it ready for an auction, you know, on location, getting all the antiques all ready to do an on-site auction. And um, I got up from the couch for a second to do, I was like cataloging or something, got up from the couch for a second. And I saw this woman like in a, briefly for just an instant, like in a black dress with a black hat, just for a fraction of a second, gone. So I got up the courage to ask the family. I said, uh, has anyone ever talked about strange things happening? She goes, do you mean the woman in the black dress? Oh, oh my God. God. Yeah. <laughs> so I had to stay overnight that night at that property to make sure no one took any of the stuff because it was outside under a tent. I slept not, not a bit. <laughs> I'm sure. Nothing happened, but I was wide awake. I was scared to death. So I never saw her. I'm glad she didn't crawl in my sleeping bag. <laughs> yeah. And what, what does make something antique 25 years old or is it more? No. Um, well, in America, uh, American, you go by the insurance rules in America. It's 100 years. In England, oh, it's 200 years. years. Wow. Yeah. But 100 years, you know, I mean, when I was a kid in the business, I remember saying, Oh, these, you know, here's the 1920s, such and such, and people are calling it antique. Well, now it is an antique. Now it is. Yeah. So for uh, some reason, we have a lot of antique shops near where we live, and we've, we've, I've never really gone in, but somehow they all stay in business. It always, like, shocks uh, people when they visit. They're like, how do the, you know, there's, say there's six antique shops, shops in our downtown area. Um, so, are but, they antique shops or thrift shops? I don't know. You tell me, man. I think they're well, thrift the, shops when they have antiques in there that uh, somebody also antiques. Well, yeah. Well, here's the thing: the antique shops do really well when there's a whole bunch of them in one area. Okay. So if you have six antique shops in a downtown, they they they're all glad they're all there because people love to go and they go from one mm. shop to the next to the next to the next. So um, they only help each other when they're in one spot like that. And that would, would, would right. they make a bunch of money off like one item to stay in business or is it, they have to sell a bunch of stuff quickly or what? Well, there's a saying that everybody makes a little bit of money or nobody makes any money. In other words, if you price something too high, it won't sell. So you, you know, you usually buy and flip it, buy and flip, you know, that type of thing, you know, and that's a whole different topic, but I could give you some <laughs> just <laughs> wondering <amazing yeah. laughs> situations that have happened that I've seen in the business that are just crazy. Um, you know, a woman that had a, a painting in her attic for years, her porch was falling off of her house. She had no money. She was on food stamps and she had a million dollar painting in her attic. She never knew it until uh, my friend discovered it and sold it for her. And she's sitting in the audience of the auction crying when the thing hits over. Wow. So That's crazy. There, there's a lot of really exciting stories like that and what I do. So it's a lot of fun. That is that does sound like fun. It's like the antique roadshow. Yeah, I've yeah. Got, um, I know. I know so many people on the Antiques Roadshow. <laughs> really? Yeah. And, yeah. And um, yeah, I'm friends with one. By the way, that had one of the most amazing UFO sightings. Oh wow! Do we? Can I tell you that story? Yes, yeah, please, please. Okay. So my friend, I'm going to say who he is because he he just he just got um, he was the Asian expert Jim Callahan on on the Antiques Roadshow for years. Oh, he wow. was a big guy, big guy that looked like. Uh, Brimley, whatever the guy's name is, Wilford, Wilford Brimley. Brimley. Yeah. 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 He looks a lot like him. So if you go <laughs> and search James Callahan, you'll see, and I don't care he can get mad at me for telling the story. <laughs> so, uh, so he's, uh, he's at Amherst college. He's in the towers. So the towers are um, 20 some odd stories high. He's in the 17th floor with his four buddies. And I don't know, they're playing cards or something like that. And they were drinking. He said, not going to say we weren't drinking. But he says, all of a sudden, he sees this. They, someone sees this in the window, uh, just you know, uh, uh, some movement, and so they look out, and there's this box-like craft. It's shaped like a rectangular box with lights on each corner and in the middle. They're all like flashing in sequence, and it's just floating on around the 17th floor, not making any noise that they can hear or anything, not moving, just stay, staying there. And all of a sudden they see it shoot off toward the mountains. And at that time, all of a sudden they see a, a, a fighter jet with its afterburner chasing after it. So it gets it all of a sudden it bursts into five lights 
And then the five lights are flashing back and forth to each other. And then it shoots off and the, the fighter jet gives up and turns around and goes back. That's his mm. UFO sighting. So I said, to him, my God, Jim, I said, unbelievable. Well, now, you know, how has that changed your life? And he said to me, can I swear on this? Yes. Okay. Well, it's not really bad. It's weird. But he said, <laughs> I don't give a shit. <laughs> So he does it. I said, so you don't care that you possibly <laughs> saw something from another planet or anything. You go, I could care less. We're all going to die anyway. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <man>. <laughs> <laughs> Screw those aliens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I thought that was quite the story. And, and just the fact that, you know, it affects everyone differently. And that's a pretty good case to show that right there. Yeah, Every time someone sees something, it either profoundly changed their lives or they just move on and okay, I have to pay the bills and that's what I'm more interested in. Yeah. I mean, even for people who, who, if they see, if they have one massive sighting and it profoundly changed their lives, but for what? Cause there's no, you can't do anything about it. Right. You no, can't like, the only thing I, you can do about it is do what I did. Well, yeah. Curious. Started. There's not enough podcasts out there. We need more podcasts. Yeah, it intrigues most. <laughs> Every Tom, Dick, and Harry has a podcast. Yours is I doing know. very well, so congratulations. You know what? There's, there's a lot of young people doing podcasts on UFOs now, which I think is great. That oh, is that's cool. interesting. Um, you know, as long as, you know, they really look into the topics. I watched a, a documentary the other day where they had all these newbies, and they got a lot of stuff wrong, but that's that's still okay. At least they're, you know, fascinated by the topic and looking yeah, into it. Looking sure. into it, yeah. So Martin, yeah. I want to thank you very much for coming on yet again. I want to sure tell thing. all of the people to go to podcastufo.com, podcastufo.com. Let me say that clearly. <laughs> yeah, you said it very fast. Yeah, it was very strange. Like an auctioneer <laughs> and an antique retro. <retro-check. laughs> yeah, you rubbed <laughs> off on me there, Martin. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> just go into your podcast player and search for podcast UFO. And actually... I'll go out on a limb and say, if you just search UFO, podcast UFO is going to come up. Yes, it will. Because it is, as I mentioned the first time you came on, kind of the gold standard for UFO shows. So congratulations on that, Martin. Well, thank you. And uh, what was the name of the guy that you mentioned that uh, we would l- love to have him on the show? What was his name again? Yes, his name is Mac Maloney. He does a radio show the same night that I do my show, and it's called Military X-Files. And he's a real character. He's really funny and he's really smart. And he's an author of uh, dozens and dozens of books, a lot of them fictional, but he has done some books on UFOs as well. And he said, boy, was that a lot of work to do the research and get things right. Awesome. So yeah, send me his contact info. And as you know, we do words of wisdom always. You're up. Oh, I'm supposed to say, I forgot about that. Well, I don't, we like just, to surprise just, our guests. <laughs> yeah, just throw me a reminder. What are you, words of wisdom? It could anything be anything you want. Anything. Like, uh, yeah, there's, there's uh, you know, what you would tell your son when you may see him for the last time or there's a sale at the local grocery store, whatever, anything. What what should we look for in an antique shop? Whatever you can think of. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, no, don't do it. <laughs> if you think you can buy if you think you're going to watch the Antiques Roadshow, <laughs> see something on there that sold for $25,000, do not think you're going to find one. Okay. That's the best advice I can give you. So it's because super people, rare. People do make mistakes all the time because something will look like something else. Ah. So, uh, you know, you have to really uh, trust people that uh, know what they're looking at. There's a lot of fake. Right. Okay, Bob, your words of wisdom. Mine are. is more general for, you know, all of you listening. Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. Today is a gift. That is why it is called a present. I'm sorry, the present. Wow. Yes, deep. I'm glad you Googled your words of wisdom this no, evening. No, actually, it was actually on uh, Kung Fu Panda. One or two, <laughs> but it sounds, you very know, nice. it's very deep, man. Okay, I like that. My words yeah. of wisdom are even more general and unuseful. Uh, if you're going to cook wings in uh, a smoker... Mm-hmm. Cook them at 300 degrees for 20 minutes, Bob. 20. So super short. 20 minutes. Then raise the temperature to 450 and hit them for seven and a half minutes. Then pull them out and immediately sauce them. So 27 and a half minutes. Yes. Those are the best wings ever. We're going to test it tonight starting right now. Perfect. Wow. <laughs> well, can I just have one more words of wisdom? Yes, please. Please. 
Keep your eyes to the sky and your curiosity high. Ooh, Very like nice. That. Not enough yeah. people to look up. I, I like that. Yeah. Basement hangout. Out. <laughs> <laughs>